Well, good morning. For those who don't know, I'm Ken Finney. Buenvenidas to the Latinos among us. This morning, uh, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of our moving here around the theme of Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. And my responsibility is to celebrate our past in Christ. Ron, who will follow me, sitting right here, uh, will honor Jesus in our present. And Brother Gary, pastor, will indicate our path forward in Jesus. And our Senor Alvarez, Pastor Alvarez, will say a little bit about the Hispanic Church, and which is affiliated with ours, meets in our building. So, let's go on to remembering Jesus the same yesterday. In Isaiah 46, 9, God ordered his people to remember carefully and earnestly those things that happened at the beginning, the first events, and our long, rich history. So I lead off this morning rec to recall where we came from and where we've been, and to reflect on the meaning of our past so that we can do as First Chronicles 16, 12 instruct us to thank God, to tell the whole world who he is and what he's done, to call out his name, to sing to him, to play songs to him, to broadcast all of his wonders, to revel in his holy name. You God seekers, that's you, okay? Be jubilant, study God and his strength, seek his presence every day and night, remember all the wonders he has performed, the miracles and judgments that came out of his mouth. Amen. In large part, we commemorate today our moving to this campus 20 years ago, so let's start there. For two decades, we've called this construction project, and that building over there, the Miracle of Colpat Creek. Colpat Creek, <coughs> named after a creek that runs right over there, and combined with the fact that the congregation dried in the building in just 52 days, the same number of days that Nehemiah and the Israelites took to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. Bunky helped Gary Blood, Lester Godwin, and the board figure out the floor plan and had the blueprints drawn up. And uh, <clears throat> meanwhile, the likes of Marvin Turner and Payson Whitman, who has now gone on, brought in heavy equipment to clear the site of trees, to haul in field dirt, construct a pad lay footings and forks cement foundations. When the preliminaries were done, actual construction of the sanctuary began. Men and women of the church did most of the work, although we did hire a train to set the rafters in place. That was, that was really a little bit beyond us. And, uh, but working Tuesday and Thursday evenings and all day Saturday, the crew framed the sanctuary, the wings, and put the roof on, installed the plumbing and the electric lines, and hung and puttied and painted the Sheet rock, walls and ceilings, laid carpet, set up chairs and office equipment. And on June 6, just a three, four days hence, 20 years ago, we moved in. And so that's where we are. Okay. And so that's the, the building part. Now, once. When the Jews demanded a miracle in order to vouch for his authority, Jesus answered them this way. He said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in just three days. Now that is not an invitation to go destroy the temple. Okay. <laughs> John goes on to explain what Jesus meant say, by the saying. And the temple he spoke of was his body. That's what John said. And because of Jesus' finished work, there's a deeper, deeper level of truth embedded in Jesus' statement. By virtue of our union with Christ, believers around the world form the church, the body of Christ. We are Jesus' body on earth today, his hands and his feet. We who gather here are the local expression of that body. Thus, when Jesus gave his cryptic response to the Jews, he not only referred to the crucifixion and resurrection of his own physical body, but his temple, so to speak, but he was speaking of us as much as he was speaking of himself. He was speaking about God's plan to redeem a people for himself, namely people like us, to build a temple where God's presence dwells. As Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 3.16, God 
don't you realize that all of you together are the house of God? That building sitting over there, that one right over there, is evidence of a more significant miracle construction underway. It's a material sign of this other house under construction. It's a place where work on that house for God to dwell in takes place. Holy Spirit's spiritual construction project of God's temple goes all the way back before the Garden of Eden when the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the, of the universe. But our particular chapter of that celestial construction project that we're celebrating today and that I know about goes back to around 1980. Led by Scotty and Howard Kendrick and, uh, and uh, Praise and Worship, and Gordon Hodge and Betty Jo and the music. Uh, the church flourished and a lot of believers from all different kinds of backgrounds from Methodists to Mennonites, from, from uh, Church of God to Catholics, from uh, Presbyterians to Pentecostal holiness, all sort of came together because they were hungry and they responded to the anointed and welcoming ministry. And so uh, the, the ministry flourished and it soon gelled into a diverse, enthusiastic assembly and that itself is a miracle that God can put together people that diverse as that. Going beyond the Sunday mornings, on the evening Wednesday services, Scotty began a school for the prophets on Thursday. He was a busy man. Started a home church on, in Raleigh on Fridays and ministered at the Crocker Nub Barn Church, one of my favorite places of worship for hay chaff and kerosene fumes met the anointing. In March 1981, many attending Westside left with Scotty and others formed Rocky Mount Christian Fellowship. Initially, we met at Josh Bullock's Barbecue on Cokie Road. Not the most elegant of surroundings, the smell of barbecue and hush puppies permeated everything. The woman had to replace the rotten curtains. But despite these handicaps, the Lord continued to bless and build his church in the hearts of his people. The following year, in 1982, we started meeting at the YMCA. Same leadership, continuing the same ministry focus. And, uh, page that got lost and shuffled here was that, that ministry focus. Part of it was that we are triune being, spirit, soul, and body. That uh, by faith we participate in Jesus' finished work. The importance of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The importance of meditating and confessing God's word and things like that. So, after some time, we moved again. Dr. Mount Christian Fellowship moved to 100 Clinton Court and supervised by Tony Sharon, men and women, gutted the North Carolina Rehabilitation Office Building and retrofitted it to serve as a meeting place and offices. Shortly after moving, Rocky Mount Christian Fellowship started Zoe Middle School, which Betty Jo has fond memories. She was a teacher. In 1990, Scotty resigned to become an evangelist and J.B. Ellis became the new pastor. J.B. Ellis introduced a denominational focus. He changed the name to Anglewood Assembly of God to make the congregation more easily identified denominational. He expanded in-church programming, started the Royal Rangers for boys, rainbows for girls, strengthened the children's church, and expanded Sunday school offerings. In 1997, J.B. resigned to take a church in West Virginia. A committee led by Al Bennett, who's here today from Jacksonville, began search for a new past pastor. The committee invited Gary Blood, and during his 20 plus years of tenure, Gary has overseen our relocation here to South Halifax Road, given priority to church outreach, emphasizing missions, giving to them and short trips to them, sponsoring Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, inspiring the men to <coughs> perform the Living Lord's Supper, usually every second year. Sometimes we even took that show on the road to <laughs> nearby churches. Now, to this point, I've been sort of focused and concentrated on the le leadership of shepherds. But shepherds without sheep is absurd. Plus, the quality of the sheep indicates the caliber of the shepherds. So, called regular members 
They're all irregular and we're more than regular, okay? <laughs> but anyway, so-called regular members are the building blocks out of which Holy Spirit is building the body of Christ on the banks of Cold Pack Creek. Peter put it this way, each one of you has become a living or lively building stone for God's use in building his house. And according to 1 Corinthians 12, every believer has their own purpose. All are essential to the body of Christ. I'd really love to bear witness to that truth, to name every individual ever affiliated with this fellowship and all of its various iterations, to celebrate their role in the facet of Christ, the body of Christ. And since we can't do that, and I won't be doing that, not today or ever, I, I, don't, I imagine, let me conclude my segment by doing this instead. I'm going to identify a variety of functions of our, in our assembly and in most other churches. And as I do so, I want everyone who has ever functioned in any way, shape, or form in that capacity to stand. And we're going to start with praise and worship. So if you have in any way, you sang in the choir, or Betty Jo has, or my wife has, has managed to get you to sing a solo, and if you played a musical instrument, Marcel, <coughs> oh, he's back there in the back, okay, he's retreated. Uh, we celebrate you. You pulled Pat Creek. No, you stay standing. You've got to stand. Okay. okay, second group children and youth ministries. If you worked in children's church, Royal Rangers, Rainbows. Vacation Bible School and you stand up. Uh, okay. Yeah, and then there's Martha's disciples. You know who Martha is, right? If you set up or took down tables or cooked food or poured drinks, Marvin, uh, or cleaned up afterwards, stand up. Okay. And uh, then there's the upper room folk. The A B technical you know, techies, uh, if you've ever been up there, videotape, they're already standing. And then there's a prayer team. You ever been in Sunday morning prayer meeting? You ever phoned in a call or got a call on the pray prayer phone? <coughs> or, where's Sharon? Published the missions brochure, stand up. And then there's Jimmy Dozer's Merry Band of Greeters. If you've handed out bulletins or everything, you need to stand up. All right? Now, I get to the most important group of all. That's the people who attend. Yes, You showed up so the teachers had someone to teach. It's really embarrassing to try to teach when nobody should. If, if you sat in a meeting, you need to be standing right now. The cooks needed somebody to feed, even if you're visiting here. And Jimmy needs somebody to hug. <laughs> so now, look around and see the real miracle of Full Cat Creek unfolding. You can sit down now. I'm done. Ron's going to, well, the car's going to come, and then Ron's going to take it. For those of you that do not know me, I am Ron, Ronnie, Ronald, and several other aliases, uh, Dyson, and my wife, Carolyn. I've been here 14 years, Betty Jo never asked me to sing, so I couldn't stand. <laughs> she heard me one time singing in a group, and she got very, very wise. I told the pastor I needed 40 minutes, but after he sent me his email, I cut it to 39. <laughs> I'm here to talk about Jesus being the same today. God has brought us a long way since 1999. And if the Lord tarries, He's going to take us a long way again. Because He just simply never ever changes. I am so glad within myself that He is the same God today that He has been not only for the Inglewood Assembly of God Church, uh, but for all churches that are preaching the wonderful, marvelous, glorious news that Jesus Christ saves. Amen. He still saves today. 
during these last 20 years here at Pole Creek, and I, I, I want to pause just a moment. Why didn't we call it Pole Creek? Pole Cat Creek Assembly. Amen. That was nice. You heard me that? You're out of order, sir. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that response. I'm glad, I'm glad I got one guy with me. <laughs> We've been about God's business, showing His love, His compassion, and encouraging people to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He is an awesome God. We've not been a social club. We've been a church striving to be disciples and discipling other people for Jesus Christ. Adding to the kingdom of God. Here's some physical things that he has helped us with over the last few years. Bucky Regis, when he was still with us, gone on to be with the Lord in glory. He built us our own God God out back to the church that we go every year and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The son comes up so wonderfully behind the crosses, which was his intention when he built that. We built a maintenance and a storage shed out back of our church and started a lighted sign out front, paved our parking lot and landscaped the property, erected a stone wall along the southern part of the property, installed a water fountain to help us, which does help us emphasize that Jesus is the living water. Amen. He is a fountain that will never ever run dry. We purchased the house and a one acre lot of land next door to the church. Build a ball field where we could be really spiritual. <laughs> Installed a playground, volleyball court, and the best outdoor basketball court in Rocky Mountain. If you haven't seen our basketball court, right around the back of the church tonight or this afternoon to take a look. I think you'll be impressed. We've upgraded our sound and our video system. We've been able to renovate our offices and our classrooms. The good news is that God through His loving people such as yourself and others that could not be here, others that have gone on to be with glory, that this is entirely paid for. Hallelujah. Our church is debt free. Give God a hand clap of praise for us. Would you? We're also a very mission-minded church. We currently support over 40 missionaries and organizations. Over the last 20 years, the church has been blessed to give over $800,000 to missions, plus $115,000 to send church members on nine mission trips. This has allowed us to allow our congregation to be ministers in other places just here at the home. That's what the Holy Spirit's about. We start at home, then we go into all the world, and we, we strive to fulfill our part in that. This has allowed us to minister through Kids Outreach in Jamaica, street outreach in Atlanta, Georgia, construction projects with three different gypsy churches in Slovakia. Last year we helped build a church building in Guayaquil, Ecuador. Also work on a teen challenge center in the Czech, excuse me, in the Czech Republic. I am convinced that our local ministry makes every effort to reach out to each and every person that attends our church that walks in our doors. We have wonderful volunteers that work with us and my wife as we strive to stay in touch with those that miss a Sunday, miss a couple Sundays, that have moved, those that have visited, uh, to try to let them know that we care, we're concerned about your every need and that we are there for you. We also do this through Vacation Bible School, which this year is June the 9th through the 12th. Jim and Sybil Hodge do a, great, do a great job in leading a strong seniors ministry force at our church. Betty Jo Turner, she's already been bragged on, so I'll just say Betty Jo Turner, leave alone. She won't let me sing. No. No, seriously, Betty Jo Turner, through, uh, though officially retired. How's retirement working for you, Betty Jo? <laughs> uh, she has retired, but until we get our new full-time minister of music to come in from Canada, she is so graciously and wonderfully volunteer, volunteers to continue to minister with us and to us and through us uh, with our music program. <coughs> through the help of faithful volunteers, we try to reach out to those that are absent through sickness and other areas. Our video and web page is presented by Brother Bill Garner. His daughter Beverly help, helps run the camera on Sunday. We cannot touch the lives of the youth in our church, 
without faithful volunteers that I have a burden to teach them each week. Having pastored myself, my wife and I, for right around 30 years before deciding to go in other areas of, of ministry for the cause of Christ, uh, I speak as one that knows a minister cannot do anything effectively without volunteers. Amen. People that are willing to help carry the torch, and we thank you for that. Then, of course, for the last 20 years, we have been blessed to have the one and only mayor of Oak Level, Jimmy Dozier, each Sunday to greet everyone out front before they go inside and are greeted again by our volunteers that they're passing out the bulletins. And again, volunteers. People that just make you feel at home. And because Jesus is the same today. Say that with me. Jesus is the same today. Now say it if you really mean it. Jesus is the same today. We have been able to accomplish this through His grace. And our job and our goal as believers in Christ is to continue on until He calls us home. One day or another He's going to call us. It'll either be when the trumpet sounds or one day you and I will stop walking and death angel will take one more step and we'll go on into eternity to meet our rewards. But until then, we're going to keep on singing. Amen. Until then, we're going to keep on laboring. Until then, we're going to continue to plant the seed. My granddaughter, Krista, just came back from India. And I was talking to her on the phone. I believe it was just yesterday. And I, my first question out of my mouth, did you have any conversions? She said, no, Papa. We watered and we planted seeds. Amen. And you know, that's what Christianity work is about. You don't always have your converts, but you always got to water. You always got to plant. Today, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. In fact, a major theme in the book of Hebrews is the immutable Christ. Immutable meaning unchanging over time, unable to be changed. And the author, we don't know exactly who wrote the book of Hebrews, but what he does is he first contrasts the chainless Christ with the ever-changing universe. Hebrews 1.12 says, They shall perish, but thou remains, and they shall all wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture thou shalt hold them, Fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Then what the author does, he contrasts the immutable of, mutability of Christ as a redeemer, a sacrifice for sin, with the changing procession of the high priest that would go in once a year on the Day of Atonement. They would go behind the veil and sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat. But Christ is our eternal high priest, who Amen. through the eternal spirit offered himself on the cross once for all to bear the sin of all mankind. Then the author contrasts the changing kingdoms of this world with the changelessness of the kingdom of God. These kingdoms are shaken so that the things which cannot be shaken and all that remain, for we receive a kingdom, the Bible says, which cannot be moved. And finally, the author contrasts the changelessness of Jesus as a friend and a teacher and a companion with the ever-changing friendships and associations in this life. He calls the role of the heroes of faith from Abel down to David and Samuel. These all having served their day and generations disappeared. By this time, the Christian disciples had lost many of their friends in death. Many of those uh, who spoke the word boldly and many died a martyr's death. And then he finally gets to the grand theme of this is Jesus Christ. The same yesterday and today and forever. All that Jesus is today, he was yesterday. Amen? All that he was yesterday, he is today. All that he will be tomorrow, he is today. All that he is today, he'll be forever and ever and ever. He was the same when the morning stars sang together. And all the sons of God shouted for joy. He was the same when Abraham rejoiced to see his day. And Moses wrote of him. He was the same when Balaam, apostate but eloquent prophet, standing on the mountain peak in Moab, cried out, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. He was the same when David sang of his everlasting kingdom. He was the same when Isaiah painted that masterpiece of his suffering that we know in Isaiah 53. He was the same when the star halted over Bethlehem. He was the same when he was transfigured in glory on the mount, when he was betrayed and denied and spat upon and crowned with thorns and hung on a cross between two thieves. He was the same when he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and he poured out his Holy Spirit on the church. Hallelujah. He was the same when the dying Stephen saw him standing 
at the right hand of God. He was the same when Peter, Paul, and Mary, and John, and Augustine, and Luther, and Whitfield, and Spurgeon, and Moody declared His redeeming love. Amen. He was the same when your mothers and fathers told you of His love. He was the same when you gave your youthful heart to Christ. He was the same whether you sat under Scotty Todd's ministry or J.B. Ellis's ministry or my ministry or Ron or Brother Ken or whoever your pastor is. He's the same. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Man's three great questions are these. What can I know? What ought I do? And for who can I hope? And Christ answers all of this. What can I know? Well, you and I can know the living God. We can know Him. Not about Him, but know Him. What ought, ought I do? Well... I ought to do the will of God and follow in the Lord's footsteps. What can I hope? Well, I can hope for a happy and blessed life now and into eternity beyond the sphere of sin and grief and death. I can hope for the everlasting promises that God has in His Word will be true for me as they were for others. Hallelujah. See what Jesus taught in the streets of Capernaum? He teaches in a thousand villages and cities today. When, when he taught in Jerusalem, he teaches in London and New York. When he taught on the banks of the Jordan and the shores of the Sea of Galilee, he teaches on the banks of the Thames and the Hudson and, and on, the, on the bank of Polecat Creek. Hallelujah. The words of Jesus will always speak to the soul of man. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. When John saw him in his great vision on the Isle of Patmos, standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks with the seven stars in his right hand and his countenance flaming like the sun and fell at his feet as one dead, Jesus lifted him up and said, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Education doesn't have the keys. Science doesn't have the keys. Politicians don't have the keys. Only Christ has the keys. Amen? Amen. Only Christ has the keys. Yes. He is Christ for your yesterday. Have there been failures, mistakes, transgressions? Absolutely. Are there things you like to forget and have blotted out? Well, Jesus is for your yesterday. Hear what he says. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like red, like crimson, they shall be as wool. He is Christ for us today. We all have our fears, our burdens, our disappointments, our loneliness, our sorrows, our infirmities, our thorns in the flesh or in the spirit. But here is what Christ for today says. Cast thy burden on the, burden on the Lord. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And beloved, he's Christ for your tomorrow. Who can tell about tomorrow? We, we try in vain to you know, you know, pull the veil back to see what we think is going to be in the future. But it's hid from us in so many ways. But whatever tomorrow brings, whatever it's going to be like, I can promise you this, Jesus is already there. Yeah. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And I want to add a couple words to this verse and I think it's okay with the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever for me amen, amen. would you say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever for me now in the last 20 years a lot has changed we have changed amen I, I've realized that this year I turned 60 and it's like woo, what a ride I've been on since I turned 60 some of you have been on that roller coaster for a while now. Our families are drift, different. My kids have grown up in 20 years. Three of my daughters are married. I have three wonderful sons-in-laws and six grandchildren. You know, they're the most beautiful you've ever seen, just like yours are. Amen? In, in the last 20 years, I, I've been thinking through this whole, this whole service about, you know, the many of our dear saints that have passed away. In fact, the folks, my, my funeral file is about six, eight inches thick. And probably we could fill these same seats with, with folks that, that have left us in the last 20 years. Uh, they're part of the underground church now. Uh, Amen. In fact, right behind this gazebo, the ashes of uh, Dan and Peggy Morgan are buried. You know, two, two dear saints that, that grew up in this whole fellowship all these years. In the last 20 years, communities have changed. This property has changed. You've changed. A lot has changed. But 20 years from now, if the Lord tarries, some of us won't even be here. Some of our loved ones won't be around anymore. This children, this church building might not be here. But, but let me tell you what you can expect 20 years from now. If the Lord tarries, if you're still here, here's what you can count on. What we've been saying, Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. But number one, the church is still going to be here. I'm not talking about this building. I'm not talking about you know just only our 
you know, congregation, but the church of Jesus Christ, the body and the bride of Christ, it will still be Amen. on planet earth. Amen. Because Jesus is the head of the church. And he's always going to have a people unto himself. You know, he's always going to have those that call him Lord. And so he will always be here. The church will be here. And my advice in that regard is to get plugged in. Make yourself irreplaceable in the body of Christ. Find your place and fulfill your purpose. It's our church theme this year, and I encourage everybody to do this. Eugene Peterson, the late Eugene Peterson, writes, Busyness is the enemy of spirituality. It is essentially laziness. It is doing the easy thing instead of the hard thing. It is filling our time with our own actions instead of, instead of paying attention to God's actions. And while you and I have, you know, smartphones and we can connect with people, we can keep in touch, we can love on them, we can, you know, do that, we, we end up, you know, we, we do a lot of things on the horizontal plane, but if we're not careful, we don't do much between us and God. Most of the things that are true in this life, you can't see. The whole invisible world of grace and love and justice. We don't see that like we need to see it. We underestimate God and we overestimate evil because we see and hear about it all the time because we're plugged in to what's happening in this world. And, we, and when we don't see God like we should because we're, we're so busy, then what we can conclude is that God's not doing anything. Evil's taken over. Let me tell you, friends, the, the Christian life is not a straight line run on a track that's laid out by a nice vision statement, you know, put together by, you, you know, a, a committee. Life, life meanders a lot of the time. There's, there's interruptions. There's unanticipated people that come our way. There's uncongenial events that cannot be pushed aside. You know, maturity can't be hurried. Programmed or tinkered with. There, there are no steroids or holy growth hormone available for growing up in Christ. It takes getting plugged into the body of Christ, which is getting plugged into the Lord. So stay and get plugged into the church. 20 years from now, if the Lord doesn't return, let me tell you what's also going to be here is His Word is going to be here. Amen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words remain forever. Four brothers left home for college. They became successful doctors and lawyers and prospered. And some years later, they chatted with after having dinner together and they discussed the gifts they were able to give their elderly mother who lived far away in another city. And the first son said, I, I had a big house built for Mama. The second said, I had a $100,000 theater built in her house. The third said, I had my Mercedes dealer deliver an SL600 to her. The fourth son said, you know how Mama loved reading the Bible and you know she can't read anymore because she can't see well. So I met this preacher who told me about a parrot that can recite the entire Bible. It took 20 preachers 12 years to teach him. So I had to pledge to contribute $100,000 a year for 20 years to his church, but it was worth it. All his mama has to do is just name the chapter and verse and the parrot will recite, recite it for her. The older brothers were impressed. After the holidays, mom sent out her thank you notes. She said, Milton, the house you build is so huge, I live in only one room, but I have to clean the whole house. Thanks anyway. <laughs> Marvin, I'm too old to travel. I stay home. I have my groceries delivered, so I never use a Mercedes. The thought was good, though. Thank you. <coughs> Mike, you gave me an expensive theater with Dolby Sound. It could hold 50 people, but all my friends are already dead. I've lost my hearing, and I'm nearly blind. I never use it, but thank you for the gesture. Then she said, Dearest Melvin, you are the only son to have the good sense to give a little thought to your gift. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> Thank you, Mama. So, so what do we do with God's Word, friends? We need to read it. We need to know it. And the Bible even says that we need to eat it. And I'm not talking about eating a Bible quote and parrot. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Another translation says, Your words are what sustain me. They are food to my soul. When I talk about con consuming the word, I'm talking about meditating on God's word. I I'm talking about that meditation can be compared to eating. Doctors say you should chew your food 32 times before swallowing. And that digestion begins in your mouth where the food is broken down before you swallow. So when you're eating lunch today, I want everybody to count everybody's chews and make sure they're getting it right. 
God's word is meant to be eaten because it's faith food. Jesus himself said in Matthew 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. The dictionary defines the word meditate as this. To talk with yourself, mutter, consider. It's an inward and outward conversation. To meditate means to study, chew, think over, ponder, muse, reflect, mull over and speculate, to think deeply, to think out, think up, dream up, to hatch, invent, create mentally. Christian meditation is not sitting on the floor with your legs crossed and your, you know, your belly button you know, down to your forehead just emptying your mind. Listen to this, friends. Meditating is a relationship with the Word of God. If you know how to worry, or if you've been offended, you know how to meditate in a negative way. You think about what could happen, what is happening, expect about what the results might be. Worry will even affect your body and emotions, you know, in a negative way. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, and it must be digested to be effective. Now, when a child first feeds himself, and I've had fun watching all six of our grandchildren go through this, the food goes everywhere. Gets in their hair, gets on their face, you know, goes on the floor, you know, and so, you know, one of, one of my daughters and their family, they have a nice big dog, so that dog is thankful for everything that falls on the floor. But when you meditate on God's healing medicine, the word does get in your eyes, it gets in your ears, it gets in your mouth, and once it gets in your mouth and you begin to digest it, this is when it brings health to your body. Proverbs 4, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings, let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life to those that find them, and health to all their flesh. King David mastered the art of meditating upon what he referred to as the law of the Lord. Psalm 1 captures the delight, discipline, and blessing that follows a person who meditates day and night on God's Word. The result of this lifestyle is this. And that's why if you do this, you can see how you'll be 20 years from now. It says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. There's a process, friends of letting God's Word sink into your heart so much that you come to a resting place where you are just able to rest in the faithfulness of God. Because you have it in you that you know that everything God's Word says is true, that He's going to keep His promises. The thoughts of God's lodge into your core of your being and you are convinced of His goodness, His grace, His provision, His healing, and His love. And if you have a relationship with Jesus, the living Word, I promise you that 20 years from now, that you're going to be prosperous in your body, mind, and spirit. You're going to be standing strong. You're going to be enjoying the abundant life in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Last thing, 20 years from now, God will be faithful. Yes. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If for some reason, from this point on or in the near future, you begin to become unfaithful and fall away from God, He will still be faithful. His Holy Spirit will hound you down the rest of your life trying to woo you back to the grace of God. He won't force you because he won't. But his voice will be quietly in your spirit. But the real question is for us is will you and I be found faithful? Will we be faithful in the next year, the next 10 years, 20 years? And the Lord's measurement of success does not mean, you know, some great endeavor that we did or spectacular activity, but that you and I in our quiet steadfastness that we find ourselves faithful where he puts us. Come on some places where we find ourselves it's hard to be faithful we wonder where the Lord is well just be faithful it's often been said that almost any of us can be heroic even daring in the midst of a, of a great uh, situation but it takes much more steadfast faith in our father to stay true in the quiet place where he puts us just be faithful it's in the daily duties of our little lives where God asks us to be loyal and steady to be counted upon, to be people who will perform our part without fanfare. You know, I like what Brother Ken did and what Ron did. You know, there's, there's folks that have titles and they do things that you see all the time, but there's so many more that just do the little part that they do. They do it faithfully week after week, month after month, year after year, and we come to count on it. Come on. Amen. It's a disappointing day if you come here and Jimmy Doge is not there to give you a hug. Amen? Amen? I mean, you think of all the folks and all of you that do all that you do, 
we do what we do unto the Lord. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And as followers of Christ, we got to not only have faith, but we got to have faithfulness. Faith can be exercised in a moment, but faithfulness is the continuing process of just trusting the Lord and living in His place. Hallelujah. Friends, I love you, but more important than anything, Jesus Christ loves you. Yes. You can leave here today just thanking Him that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful what He's done. I'm thankful for the precious saints that I've got to know through these years, you know, that have gone on before us to be with the Lord. We know where they are. Hallelujah. One day we'll meet them. One day all this that we know will be gone. And all we'll know is Jesus. He'll be the light of heaven. We won't need any of that because He is the light. But until then, until then, let's be faithful. Let's be faithful. We can be faithful because He's faithful. And we're hid in Christ Jesus so we can do it. Amen. Amen. Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, I thank for everybody here today, every family that they represent, every blessing of God that they are, every miracle that has been performed in their life, your grace and your goodness that you bestowed upon every one of us. Father, we thank you for 38 some odd years of wonderful ministry of people, the, the Rocky Mount Christian Fellowship, Anglewood Assembly of God. Father, we those are just names in this earth, but we're part of the family of the living God. We're daughters and sons of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we're thankful for that today. We're thankful for everything you've done, for what you're doing, and what you're going to do. Because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We give you glory. So God, today is, it hasn't been about, look what we have done, Father. It's just another reminder of what you have done. And what you've done in the past, you're still doing today. And what you're doing today, you're going to continue to do tomorrow as long as we'll be faithful. As long as Lord, we'll step up and take our role and take our part to do what you call us to do, we'll continue to do the great exploits that are laid out for us in Hebrews chapter 11. We're, we're part of that cadre today, and we thank you for it, Lord Father. In Jesus' name, amen. On the back of the program, there's a couple announcements that you can read in your time. There's also uh, some folks that we're, we just want to thank that made the preparations, that paid for everything that we're going to enjoy today. So if you would, just give all those folks a big round of applause. <laughs> Hallelujah. The, uh, the food should be ready at about 11.45, so that's just a few minutes from now. The, the fans will please take them. They take extra. Uh, if you see it laying around, we want you to have it. Uh, we're so glad that you came and hope you all can stay for lunch. And so what we want to do for lunch is we're going to go in uh, the front doors. Uh, you're going to take a right and go through the kitchen. Parkers will serve you. Out in the foyer, we've got a table that's got drinks and another table that has desserts. And so just help yourself. Uh, enjoy the rest of this day. Uh, get to know one another a little bit more. Catch up uh, with some folks you haven't seen for a while. And so... Let me go ahead and pray for the meal so that you go in and when they're ready, we'll just go eat, okay? Father, we thank you for this opportunity now to share a meal. What a joy that is as brothers and sisters in Christ to eat together. Lord, we see so much of your ministry just around the table. And Lord, we know that ministry will continue from here underneath this tent to those tables inside as we just enjoy wonderful fellowship together. Bless this food to our bodies. We thank you for those that have prepared it and those that have labored and given so that we can enjoy this wonderful day. And Lord, we thank you for the beautiful weather you gave us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.